Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, long forgotten murders, all set within and beyond the West End. Today's episode is about Countess Lubienska, a formidable woman who endured a life of unspeakable horrors, and yet she never stopped fighting for the rights of others. But when a simple night out turned deadly, her last fight would be for her life. Murder Marley's research used authentic sources. It contains moments of satire, shock, and grisly details. And as a dramatization of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds. So that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 147 Resistance The Last Fight of Countess Lubienska. Today, I'm standing at the Gloucester Road tube station, SW7, two streets east of the Polish super spy, Christina Skarbek, four streets northwest of the Devil Child's home invasion, directly opposite the basement where John George Haig dissolved the entire McSwan family in a drum of acid, and three streets from the infamous killings of a misunderstood young man. Coming soon to Murder Mile. This is Platform 5 of the eastbound Piccadilly Line service at Gloucester Road. With the surface station opened in 1868 and the deep level lines in 1906, following a recent refurbishment, much of this tube stop remains unchanged. With its ornate titling, its deep green and cream tiles, its blood red surface station, and its wonderfully arched platforms down below. Aesthetically, it's actually quite beautiful. Sadly, many commuters miss this, as the platform is merely a place where they grumble about a train being delayed by a full minute. And for the rest of the journey, with heads down, a book open and earphones on, they daren't catch anyone's eye for fear of engaging in an actual conversation with a real human being. Except to grunt at someone whose bag's on a seat, to tutter to flannel dodger for whom deodorant is merely a yearly gift, and to gasp at the ladies who manage to perfectly apply their makeup on the world's bounciest tube ride without looking like they've been smooched by Bongo the Clown. Minding your own business is a skill we've all mastered, especially in London. But when crimes occur, this apathy makes for a terrible witness. On Friday the 24th of May 1957, at 10.19pm, a Piccadilly line train from Earl's Court pulled onto Platform 5. From the middle of seven carriages, most of which were a third full of revellers heading to or from the West End. A tall, elderly, white-haired lady exited the train. Her name was Countess Lubienska, a truly formidable woman who looked a little frail, but with fire in her blood, she was unafraid to right the injustices of the past. But somewhere between the platform and the lift, she was murdered. As it was here, having battled her way through a life of horror and pain, in a tube station miles from her broken home, that Countess Lubienska would lose her last ever fight. If you think you know what courage is, think again. Countess Lubienska was born Teresa Zarinska 
on the 18th of April, 1884, the daughter of Vladislav and Dorota. Raised amongst the wealthy Polish elite in southeastern Poland, her early life was privileged. She lived on a large country estate, and she was educated at an elite Catholic boarding school for girls. In 1902, aged 18, she married Count Edward Lubienska, a prominent man from a once powerful Polish clan, for whom money was no object, and together they raised three children, Isabel, Stanislav and Isabella. Given her upbringing, she could easily have become just another pointlessly pampered lady living a life of luxury, as from her high horse she looked down her nose at the less fortunate below. But that was not Teresa. Revered throughout Poland for her generosity of wealth and spirit, she was esteemed throughout the country, with every Pole knowing that her home was always open to all. She fed the poor, and she nursed the sick. But what made her more impressive was how she fought with those who needed her help. Teresa was a firebrand, a force to be reckoned with, who sought out injustice and was never afraid to pick a fight with someone bigger than herself. As a moral woman who couldn't abide bad behavior, she would single-handedly tackle ruffians in the street and easily go 12 rounds with any fascist. But what she lacked in size, she more than made up for in presence. As when she spoke, they listened. But when anyone needed an ear, she was silent. Teresa was staunchly loyal and had a remarkable memory for details. She always remembered her name and she never forgot her face. During the First World War, she served in the Red Cross and fought for her country supporting the 14th Regiment of Jaslavek Uhlans and also served alongside the Red Army in Kuban, southern Russia. By 1918, the war may have been over, but her fight had only just begun. Following the October Revolution and the armed uprising of the Bolsheviks, as hostilities erupted between Russia and Poland, their country estate was encircled, and being a prominent Polish diplomat, the enemy forces stabbed her husband to death. To protect her three young children, Teresa fled with nothing but the clothes on their backs, as the Red Army stripped their home of money and possessions. Witnessing her husband's brutal murder, the rape of her life, and death threats against her family, that would have been enough to break anyone. And yet, Teresa never gave up. Instead, she fought on. Over the next two decades, living in a small top-floor flat at 6 Shepnir Street in Warsaw. This widowed single mother earned a modest wage as an accountant for the post office savings bank. And although times were hard, she continued to shelter the poor, to feed the hungry, and to fight her oppressors. But as hard as her life was, it was about to get even worse. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland in a blistering blitzkrieg attack. Within six days, the country had fallen, its military was wiped out, and its people had fallen under Nazi and Soviet control. 700,000 Poles were captured, 133,000 were killed, one of whom was Teresa's only son, Stanislav. 
seen by the Nazis as Untermensch, a subhuman species. With many Poles, especially Jewish Poles, confined to the ghetto, disease and famine swept through Warsaw, and so hungry were the people that when a horse fell dead in the street, they stripped it for meat until all that was left was bones. Teresa was alone and struggling. But there was no time for selfishness or grief, as many would resort to, as the Polish people needed her help, and no matter what, she would fight to protect them. Her shabby little top floor flat at 6 Shepnir Street was home. But it was far from safe, as with the German barracks in front, a Gestapo building behind, and all the other floors occupied by enemy soldiers, she was very much a lone hen in a fox's den. But this didn't stop her doing her patriotic duty. As a resistance fighter and a lieutenant in the Polish underground army, her flat became a key base for operations for the resistance movement, where industrial sabotage and the assassination of fascist collaborators was planned. And for three years, she continued to hide dissidents, spies, refugees, and even an entire family for six months. In that tiny flat, right under the noses of the Nazis. But as selfless as Teresa was, simply to save their own skin, someone ratted her out. On the 11th of November 1942, Teresa was arrested without trial, sent to Warsaw's brutal Paviak prison, where resistance fighters were hanged in public as a warning to others. And here, she was tortured. Relentlessly and without mercy, she endured weeks of painful and humiliating tortures, day and night. Designed to break her spirit, she was starved, sleep-deprived, drowned, frozen and raped. Forced to stand in stress positions, as she was beaten with an iron bar, whipped red raw and kicked until she was black and swollen, Many sadistic techniques included the snapping of bones, nails being ripped out, genitals burned, and being taken to the brink of death, she would be brought back to life, only to be tortured again. These savage beatings would have broken even the toughest of soldiers, but Teresa never broke. In fact, for the rest of her life, she would wear the scars on her flesh like a badge of honour and defiance. And yet, as hard as her life had been so far, it was about to get even worse. From Warsaw, Teresa was sent to the Ravensbrück concentration camp, where you were either worked to death, starved to death, or were gassed in the extermination chambers. Imprisonment had left her frail and weak, as like so many others, being riddled with lice and scabies in this filthy hellhole, she fell seriously ill in a camp riddled with dysentery, tuberculosis, typhoid and pneumonia. But what kept her alive was her formidable spirit and her unwillingness to let the Nazis win. Even inside, Teresa put others before herself. Nicknamed the White Angel of Ravensbrook, her self-sacrifice and kindness made her legendary amongst prisoners, and so feared amongst the Gestapo that for almost two years she was held in a special punishment block. And again, she was tortured. In January 1945, 
With the tide of war turning against Hitler, the Nazis began destroying all evidence of their barbaric crimes, including the mass extermination of its prisoners at camps like Ravensbrück. In the final weeks of the war, Count Volk Bernadotte, regarded as the Swedish Oskar Schindler, made a secret deal with Heinrich Himmler and negotiated the release of 31,000 prisoners. On the 28th of April 1945, Theresa found herself standing on the quay at the Swedish port of Malmo. She was little more than a skeleton, swathed in filthy oversized rags, with a shaven head and shoes made of paper. But finally, she was free. And yet, like many Poles, her fight was far from over. With the Potsdam Conference divvying up Poland amongst the Allies and the Soviets, like this already smashed and battered country was a spoil of war. With her hometown now under communist control, this Allied collaborator knew that if she ever returned to Poland, she risked being shot as a spy. So with no other options, no money and no possessions, Teresa moved to London, where 12 years later, she was murdered. During the post-war years, to many who never knew this amazing woman, the Countess was just a little old lady, frail, thin and weak but with a bob of white hair and a very defiant walk. Struggling to get British citizenship, she found it difficult even to get a menial job, and so she had to rely on charity. It's unsurprising that living in a small rented room in Cornwall Gardens, two streets from the Gloucester Road tube station, that she became friends with Christina Scarbeck. Codename Christine Granville, the former super spy, who at the same time was reduced to working as a hotel maid, and when she was later murdered by her stalker, one of the mourners who stood at her graveside was Teresa. Through the 40s and the 50s, the city was full of refugees who were displaced and abandoned. And although Teresa had nothing, she fed the poor, she nursed the sick, and with her indomitable spirit, she slammed her fist on the table of debate, demanding that the voice of the people be heard. As chairman of the Polish Association of Ex-Political Prisoners, Teresa spoke out against communists, Nazis, fascists and racists. She picked fights with Władysław Gomolka, the communist leader of post-war Poland. She waged a vicious battle with the East German government to get compensation for refugees. And as a Catholic, she was unafraid to take on the might of the Vatican, from Cardinal Wozinski all the way up to the Pope. For many Poles in Britain, Teresa was beloved. But by those she opposed, she was feared. By May 1957, Teresa was 72 years old. Her health was declining, but still fighting on. That fire in her belly was as fierce as ever. As just like her death camp tattoo and the torture scars which pockmarked her cut and burned body, Although time had made them fade a little, they would never disappear. And still being a model woman, she was not averse to clipping a ruffian about the ear for foul language. In the two weeks leading up to her murder, Teresa received three death threats. Two by phone, one by letter, and all were anonymous vague threats 
issued at a distance by cowards. Rightly, she informed the police. But she wasn't overly concerned, given the real horrors of the life she had lived. Friday the 24th of May 1957 was a good day. The weather was warm, but cool. And as a very social person, Teresa had been to a friend's birthday party on Florence Road in Ealing. Dressed in a set of pearls, a white jacket, and a little hat with bright flowers. Although she was poor, she always dressed well. At a little after 9.50pm, being in good spirits, but not being a night owl, Teresa said her goodbyes and left the party accompanied by a good friend, Father Kazimierz Krasnowski, a Roman Catholic priest, the Polish assistant to the Brompton Oratory, and a survivor of the Dachau concentration camp. Just shy of 10pm, they entered Ealing Common Tube Station purchased two single tickets and sat in the seventh compartment of the district line tube train. The journey was uneventful. The carriage held roughly 12 people, all of whom were quiet, and as often happens, they kept to themselves. At no point did they sense any danger. They weren't approached, harassed, and as far as we know, followed. As Father Krasnowski lived at Redcliffe Gardens in Kensington, at Earl's Court they exited the train. With a short walk to his home, he wished his friend a good night and left the station. Teresa changed trains and took the eastbound Piccadilly Line service one stop east to the Gloucester Road tube station. Being a Friday night, and one hour before the pub's chuck out, the train, which held an average of 222 seated passengers, was roughly one third full of workers and revellers going to and from the West End. At 10.18 p.m., just one minute before, the westbound service departed, so that by the time that the eastbound service pulled onto platform five, both platforms were bustling with pockets of people, but they weren't busy. At 10.19 precisely, entirely alone, Teresa exited the train onto a wide, well-lit platform. Speaking to no one and walking at her usual determined pace, she followed the exit sign and headed up a short set of stairs along the tiled corridor towards the passenger lifts and the station concourse above. The distance from the train carriage to the lifts was roughly 80 paces. But no one saw her, heard her, or witnessed her murder. Emmanuel Oluakinyemi a 32-year-old ticket inspector was manning one of the three passenger lifts that night. At 10.18 p.m., to catch the eastbound Piccadilly line service, which Teresa was on, he saw two people enter the lift. A short brunette lady in red shoes and a fair-haired foreigner in a check suit. Apart from them and two other members of staff, the concourse was empty as he entered the lift with his passengers. During its brief descent, he heard a scuffle coming from in or near the iron spiral staircase to the right of the lifts, and assumed, as had happened many times before, that it was tearaway kids trying to avoid paying the fare. But as the lift doors opened and the scuffling stopped, he witnessed no kids playing up. Instead, he saw a lone woman, frail, tall, and white-haired. 
a haunted expression on her face and her arms outstretched as she staggered towards the lift weakly muttering bandit bandit putting out his hands to aid her inside her jacket he spotted blood pouring from the left hand side of her chest and although this strong-willed woman remained upright as they ascended clutching her heart she collapsed at the foot of the lift she was taken to nearby st mary abbot's hospital but shortly after her arrival she died Teresa had been stabbed 5 times with a small short-bladed knife once in the stomach once in the back and 3 times in the left-hand side of her chest with 2 piercing her heart she had no defensive wounds a search was conducted of the station the platforms and all departing trains as well as the tunnels but no weapon or assailant was found A street to street search was initiated, but with no description of the aggressor, this proved fruitless. A few spots of blood were seen beside the iron staircase by the lifts, but with no witnesses, police could only speculate that this was where the attack had taken place. And although fingerprint experts were called in, being a high traffic area, there were no usable prints. The investigation was headed up by Detective Chief Inspector John DeRose and Chief Superintendent Edward Greeno of the Met Police. But given the victim's status, they were also joined by MI5. A public appeal was made. 18,000 passengers and staff were interviewed. 214 Piccadilly line trains were examined. Any person in their address book was contacted. And over the next few months, every knife found in any station was handed to forensics to be tested. Of the 13 people in that eastbound Piccadilly line carriage that night, most were traced. Of the 17 who rode up in the lifts at the time of the attack, almost all were found. But for whatever reason, maybe they didn't recognize themselves. Maybe they didn't see anything strange or maybe they just didn't want to come forward. Many witnesses remained unidentified, like the brunette in the red shoes and the foreigner in the check suit. The case remains active. But as of today, no one has been arrested for Teresa's murder. So who killed Teresa and why? It was unlikely to be a robbery as a silver brooch was still pinned to her jacket and a handbag was on her arm. But as someone who would never back down from a fight, this could never be ruled out. As a moral woman who was quick to rebuke the rudeness of ruffians, a relative later stated that Teresa often used the word bandit to describe hooligans and a station porter had seen a gang of youths getting up to mischief on the platform shortly before the murder as a political animal who was beloved by many but equally as feared by others teresa had ruffled the feathers of nazis communists fascists and racists all of whom she referred to as bandits as well as the governments of West Germany, Russia and Soviet backed Poland and the Vatican. But if this was an assassination, why murder a frail old lady a decade after the end of the war? That year, the murder rate in London was at its highest. So it could have been a politically motivated hit or just as easily an unplanned attack by a lone nut job the jealous reaction of a stalker as it happened to christina scarbeck a case of mistaken identity or someone 
who everyone agreed never forgot a face. Maybe she spotted someone from her past who was wanted for war crimes. But let's not remember her for her death. Let's remember her for who she was. A resistance fighter, a charity worker, a humanitarian, a champion of the poor, a defender of the right, an agitator of the wrong, a mother, a wife, a widow. And above all, she was Countess Teresa Lubienska, a living legend. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. As always, if you love to listen to a fat, bald man waffle on about tea, cake, Eva and Coots, and you're keen to hear some more details about this case and do a little quiz, stay tuned till after the break. If not, that's not a problem. A big thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who are Becky McDowell, Chris Hawkes and Craig Stevens. I thank you, and so do the Coots. But Eva doesn't, not because she's rude, but because she's suffering from a massive hangover. Again. What can I say? She likes yards of ale. Murder Mile was research written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. Good, well done, Michael. That wasn't too bad. That wasn't too bad, considering, considering. Hello, everyone. How are we all? We all good and healthy and well, and uh, you're keeping well and happy. That's key at the moment, isn't it? Key. Keep, keep well. Keep happy. Do the things that make you happy. Don't worry about the things that you can't control. I think that's key to life, isn't it? Like me this morning. Woke up, welcome to Extra Mile, by the way, the unedited, unscripted bit. Uh, if you're new to this, this is kind of, uh, it's, it's unedited, it's a bit waffly. I do some details about the case, we do a quiz. If you don't like waffle, switch off now. If you do, please do stay, pop on a tea, which I'm going to do very shortly. Um, yeah, this morning was a weird one. I'm moored up in a, in a very nice place that I like. I've got uh, nice neighbours all around me, everyone's really nice. We, we've been out having a good chat, as, as you should do as good neighbours. I moved away from my old location because my old neighbour... I think he was a bit unwell. Uh, he smashed my night lights in the middle of the night because he was having an argument with the night with the lights, which was a bit weird. So I've uh, I've I've made sure that the local mental health authority are aware of him because as boaters move between different boroughs, I think it might be difficult for people to get the help that they need. So I've made them aware of where he is and maybe. Maybe they can help him a bit. Uh, so I've moved to a new location. Uh, unfortunately, we've got a lock next to us that people keep leaving the gates open. It's got a real bad lock, uh, leak on it. Uh, so quite often the boats are grounded, which means they, they tip a bit. Woke up this morning, fell out of bed because my boat was leaning about 20 degrees the wrong way. So, uh, yeah, so I've just been out fixing the lock, uh, but come back and I'm and, and, and doing this. And actually, I whizzed through that recording. That was pretty good. I'm just going to open some doors. And has the people who went through, did they lock the gates? Let's have a look. They did, I think. My eyesight's not very good. Um, I've left little notes on the lock saying, please lock the gates, they're leaky. And it's it's been quite good. Everyone seems to be locking the gates, but... You never know. Let me just put on my tea, my tea and my coffee and open some windows and doors. Uh, I'm right next to a big train track and there's an airport not too far away, so it's a bit noisy. Hang on, let me open up windows and doors. Right, tea on. Uh, let's do ke coffee. Yeah, let's do a coffee. I need one. It's early. I need coffee. Oh, hang on. Sugar. Two, obviously. One for me, one for Eva. Eva, do you want a coffee? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's hung over again, as always. You know what she's like. She, she, she boozes really heavily. What else is going on in the world? Let's have a look. Let's go through, go, go quickly to my notes. That was, uh, we're through that episode. I'm trying to get myself into, as I mentioned before, into a, a, a mode of being more efficient the way I do things. Because sometimes I, I daydream too much. 
and I worry about stuff too much. Whereas what I've worked out is if if you say to yourself, right, just get it done, and you, you, I have to chastise myself a lot, I can get things done better. So in the old days, writing an episode would take three, four, sometimes five days to write an episode. I wrote this one in a day and a half. I'm quite pleased. And I, do you know what? I was ple- really pleased with this episode as well. It feels nice. It's got a nice tone to it. I said to myself right at the start, what's it about? I said, right. And I, I knuckled down and I said to myself, no, you can't have a cake until you finish this scene. And you can't go for a walk until you finish that scene. And then you've got to do that. And you've got, yeah. And it really worked. So, uh, yeah. So, um, so I'm getting my head in the space so for you know, uh, uh, when I move on with the boat, I I can have a little bit of time off, but also work on other projects as well. So, but what I don't want to do is lose the quality of the episodes. That's why I'm fighting to keep the quality high, but give myself a little bit more time. But it's, it's not about rushing. It's just about not doing other shit, like staring into space and having imaginary conversations with myself, which I do a lot. So, uh, but that's all good. Uh, and not being distracted. So I'm just f- more focused. So that's all it is. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, the Pooh Man came by the other day, which my brother was very, uh, uh, found very amusing. Because living on a boat, uh, obviously, you have the coal man who delivers your coal and your fuel and, you know, your multi-fuel and all that. But also you have the, you have the Pooh Man. My, I've got a big septic tank under my boat and it was full. And it was brimming with, like, like lots of poo and wee. And luckily the Pooh Man turned up. So that was the exciting day of my life when uh, Warren turned up and pumped out all the poo. And then suddenly my boat turned the other way. It was like it was like five degrees the other way because the weight of the poo is all on one side. My tea's up. Um, here we go, that's exciting. You've learned about, you've learned about my defecation. Oh joy. Does life get any better than that? Oh God. Hang on, I'm gonna have one of them. I shouldn't, but I will. Uh, there we go. So that's all good. Everything's going all well here. Obviously, we've got Crime Con in about a week's time. By the time you hear this, I'm all geared up for that. Uh, I'm, we're still working through the old episodes of Murder Mars. So I've, I'm going through them very carefully, and I'm re. I'm not. All I'm doing is kind of getting rid of any mistakes that I don't like. But mostly, I'm bumping up the sound because, as mentioned, I they were. Old software, old laptop, old microphone, things like that. They're all a little bit quiet and there are mistakes that I don't like. So I've bumped up the sound to increase them to... Because the new episodes, if you listen to them now, you'll go, oh, okay, there's a lot There's a lot more volume and you can hear everything. Whereas if you... I mean, you won't now. But if you go back to the original old episodes, they're really quiet. So, But the new ones that are available. So I've done... I'm working my way through the Blackout Rippers. So everything from the first episode up to the Blackout Rippers are done now. So that's all good. Um, what else is going on? Uh, you uh, Don't forget you can join the, the YouTube channel. I've got all the old location videos are all up there. There's like a hundred and like 150 location videos up there and all of the uh the old episodes are up there. So if you want to if you want to sit at your laptop or whatever and listen to them on YouTube, you can do. It's all free. You don't have to and uh no. No, I had a thought then, but the thought ran out of my head. Anyway, what else is going on? Um, uh, Police Constable Arsenal Goodness very kindly turned up uh, last uh, last week on the boat, which is very nice. Very kind of him. He'd just done the night shift, poor bastard. Done the night shift, overslept slightly, made it all the way across London from from uh, Police Constable Arsenal Guinness HQ, which is down in the south, to where I am, far in the north. Uh, and we re-recorded New Blue, and I've already kind of worked on the first episode, and that's that sounds really good, and the other two sound really good as well. Unfortunately, we had technical problems with the with the first recording, so we're doing we did that, all went really well, and then we had a few beers, obviously. So uh, thank you, Police Constable Arsenal Guinness. Uh, that's very kind of you. Uh, it all went really well, and uh, those three episodes will be out uh, kind of uh, early to mid October. That I'm using those as kind of the break between when I do the research for the final eight episodes. Ah, oh, right. Uh, let's dive in and do the quiz. I've got a Kit Kat with me right now. Oh, I've got no cake. I, I did have a cake. I ate it. I was hungry. And to be honest, I didn't think I'd be finished so quickly with this episode. So, And this recording went quickly as well. Except this bit, which is waffle. Right. Let's do the quiz, everyone. Oh, question number one. What religion was Teresa. 
Question two: What was Teresa's husband's name? I've just written down his first name here because obviously you know what his surname is. Ooh, there's a little bit of a bit of a Trump there. Not a, not a Donald Trump, a uh, a uh, Botty Trump. Same thing, really. Um, uh, question three: uh, What was in front and behind her flat in Warsaw? Question four: Which concentration camp was she sent to? Question five: On what day did the German invasion of Poland begin? You get an extra point if you can name how many uh, how many days it lasted. Question six: What was her nickname at the concentration camp? Question seven. Which Polish spy was her friend? Question eight. Which hospital did she die in? Some reports online uh, uh, and newspapers got it wrong. I had to double check this. I think they got a bit lazy with choosing hospitals. Uh, question nine. Who headed up the investigation? So who headed up the police investigation? There were names of two people. And question 10, who was she buried near? So there we go, there's that. Lovely jubbly. Okay, uh, let's dive into some extra stuff about this case. Uh, there's a bit that I kind of, I, I needed to gloss over it a little bit too quickly because uh, as mentioned, it kind of slows down the story, but uh, the liberation of the concentration camps. So many of them were obviously uh, liberated in and around the point of the 30th of April, 1945, which is the day that Hitler died. By that point, basically everything was collapsing for the for the German army anyway. So they uh, many were in retreat. And, and as mentioned, people like Heinrich Himmler were already kind of negotiating kind of the release of prisoners themselves, kind of in a way to kind of... They knew that they were going to be... Um, taken to trial or whatever so they're you know, trying to save themselves uh a blue-blooded swede called volk bernadotte uh who's also count of wiesborg hope i pronounced that correctly uh made a secret deal with heinrich himmler and he negotiated the release of thirty-one thousand prisoners from german concentration camps they were released on the 14th of april 1945 now you may think to yourself Oh, well, do you know, they, they would have only been in the camps for two more weeks if it was liberated on the 30th. But those last two weeks were absolute. I mean, the, all of it was horrific, but the last two weeks were especially horrific. As the German right was starting to collapse, they were trying to eradicate everything that they had there. Uh, so there was, a, there was a lot of kind of proposals going on and a lot of negotiations happening. Um, so she was released from name of concentration camp which was obviously one of the questions um she was uh trying to try to see so uh at that point ravensbrook was uh, oh, that was the answer to one of the questions uh, this is hard to do uh the concentration she was at was still under nazi control uh it was during these final desperate weeks that more than 6,000 women in that particular concentration camp was gassed uh many were shot many were starved um Many were forced to, uh, onto death marches, as they call them, to kind of march them to different areas. Obviously, they, they were starving. They had no muscles. They were weak. Many died en route. Many were shot en route. This was as the German SS started to empty the camps and try and destroy all of the evidence. So, uh, I, uh, I, Teresa uh, was one of those that was saved. It, it was, I, I don't really know whether uh, she whether the count actually knew her or whether it was just kind of a random a random shot that he picked but yeah she was uh, uh 28th of april she made it to the swedish port of malmo there's uh they're, they're known as the white buses the infamous white buses that kind of drove them up to the um up to the port um and apparently all of them were kind of you know thin in rags with shoes made of paper wood and odds and ends uh, but there was a real mixture of French, Polish, Norwegian, Dutch and many other nationalities. Uh, many of the women who were taken off the boats as they arrived, many couldn't even walk. Many were kind of carried on stretchers. Uh, so there was roughly in that dock around five th 500 or so women who arrived and they were taken away in the in the Swedish Red Cross bus buses and ambulances. Uh, and many were found kind of new homes in new areas. But um, uh, Theresa spent a while in Stockholm. Um, but it's unclear exactly when she came to Britain. It's either 
1946 or 1947. She lived in a small rented flat. It was furnished. She lived alone. It was in Cornwall Gardens in Kensington. I've searched. I can't find out what number it was. It doesn't seem to be reported anywhere. The the, the file in the National Archives is not available. So, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find that out. But it's not really relevant, to be honest. Uh, unfortunately, as mentioned, she couldn't she couldn't get British citizenship, as with um, uh, quite a few other people who'd actually fought fought to protect our country were not given citizenship. Oh, I whacked my arm on the lock this morning when they, uh, the lock was closing back up and the windlass, which is the big key, used to open it, spun around and hit me on the arm. My arm is aching. Oh, it hurts. Uh, she was living, at that, she had to live at that time on charity, as mentioned, uh, and on national assistance, which was benefits. Um, at that point, her daughter uh, and uh, had her own family and was living in Paris. So the Countess uh, was actually living alone by that point. Uh, what else did we get? But uh, once in London, uh, she devoted her life uh, to redressing uh, the injustices that had happened to her countrymen in the German concentration camps. So even though even though she hadn't got she hadn't got any money to be honest, and she was kind of living living on charity, uh, she was in contact with more than a thousand Poles who had since fled to England, and more than five thousand who were currently living in Europe. She was described as one of the most active members of the Polish community in the country. When you look at her life, you just go, it really puts everyone to shame, doesn't it? It really, like, you, you look you look at her life and you think, oh, I've achieved a lot. But when you look at someone like her, you go, wow, I really haven't achieved that much. And then you think about all your problems in life and you think, oh, God, my life's so difficult. I went to get rice at the shops today and they hadn't got brown rice, so I had to get white. You know, and then and then you look at her life and you go, fucking hell, what an, ama- what an amazing woman. And she just never gave up and she kept fighting on. You know, absolutely amazing. Uh, so we dive into a couple more details about the murder. Um, uh, the ticket inspector slash lift attendant, he was one of the three members of staff on time at that time. That was Emmanuel Olu Akinyemi. He was 32. Um, as he was coming down the lift, he heard a scuffle coming from the stairs leading down to the platform. Uh, the, the, the spiral staircase is just to the right of the lifts. Um, and as mentioned, he, you know, normally kids kind of run up there to try and avoid paying the fare. Um, but it wasn't kids. Knife was never found. Uh, we know it's short. It's a short bladed knife. Uh, it's still uncertain to this day whether she was stabbed by one person or two. When you look at her, she's stabbed three times. Hang on, once in the stomach, three times in the chest and once in the back. So it could be two people could be three people it could just be one person uh so we really don't know what it is all she could ever say was bandit bandit some people suggested that she said bandit bandit i've been knifed but most people say that she all she could she could say was bandit um but what she meant by bandit we still don't know whether it meant hooligans sometimes she said uh, hooligans to her meant people who were you know using bad language or, or drunk and disorderly or things like that so it's got a big, a big umbrella term but also she used bandits meaning you know uh, uh communists fascists racists people like that um the attack so the attacker where would the attacker have gone so uh the lift from the entrance level to the platform took roughly 48 seconds uh, i've ridden i've ridden i've ridden up in the lift myself um it's it's a newer lift but the the timings are, are pretty much not too far off because you can't go up too fast in a lift because you've got passengers in it and it, it needs to be safe uh so if you go from the entrance level to the platform it's about 48 seconds climbing the stairs uh you can do it in less than a minute if you're walking up but you can sprint up it in about about 30 35 uh so her assailant could have come out through the uh, main platform concourse but no one kind of see saw him but let's not forget that there were you know were people looking did were they looking towards where the sound was coming from as opposed to the stairs uh or did the assailant go back into the platforms? Because if you go down back into the platforms, you've got a choice. You've got two Piccadilly line trains. You've got east and west. So easily, given the fact that there's a train pretty much every minute, you could jump on either train uh, and disappear. Uh, it's, there's also a district line train there as well. So uh, district line, I think it's circle as well. 
So yeah, could have disappeared anywhere. We don't know. We don't know who they are or where they went. Um, the uh, lift operator said he he heard footsteps on the spiral staircase leading to the street. Uh, but was that the attacker or was that someone else on one of the other tube trains coming in or leaving? We don't know. So this is this is what's. Don't forget, as mentioned, this is a high traffic area. So it's you, you can't just say, well, we'll get some fingerprints. All looks and footprints. It it doesn't work that way. Um, they I, I I read a statistic the other day on how many people use that tube station. It's ridiculous. It's something like like millions, millions of people every year use that tube station. So, and if you think about it, it's like they're not going to fully scrub everything every day to make it fully clean. It's like you have a bit of a sweep up, and you know maybe in times of COVID you have a little bit of a wipe down of the handrails, but that's about it, really. So there's go, there's going to there'll be fingerprints there from ages ago. Uh, as mentioned, they looked in all the adjacent tunnels, but there was no trace. They'd shut down the trains. Uh, they checked all the emergency exits. It was They couldn't find anyone. The, uh, even though she'd been stabbed five times, uh, most of the blood was kind of coming through. It really wasn't pumping through. It was kind of seeping into her clothes. So they found a couple of spots of blood near the stairs to the lifts, but they're still not... They, the police were never too sure exactly where she was murdered. No one saw her on the platform being attacked. No one saw her in the tiled corridor as she walked up. She didn't seem to be by herself at that point. Uh, and no one was coming out through the lifts. Um, if you're a patron subscriber, I've done, uh, uh, as always, a video there. But I've also done you a video of the last what I reckon is about 80 paces that uh, she would have taken from the platform to uh, the lift itself. So you can see, you can see it's not far, but there's, but there's nowhere to turn. Literally, if you go, if you go on the platform and you go up the stairs, you can't turn left and right. It's a corridor. There's nowhere to go. The only way you can go is into the lifts or up the staircase, which you, but that's even, that's a bit of a trek anyway. So it's a, uh, yeah, they don't know exactly where she, where she was attacked. Um, uh, at street level, uh, she was put in the care of station in Inspector Clark. And as mentioned, the lift attendant called uh, 999 by the nearest public telephone. Obviously, the station didn't have its own phone. Don't forget, this is 1950s. Um, first officer on the scene was PC Ron Sherfield of the Met Police, who, who happened to be passing the station at that point. He accompanied the injured woman to St Mary's Hospital and en route, uh, he said her last words... Uh, well, he says her last words were, I was on the platform, then stabbed. But obviously he's the only one can, that can corroborate that. So, do you know, maybe, maybe she was. Maybe she had the energy. It's interesting because uh, the lift attendant said that she hadn't got any energy left. Even the, the, the policeman before, he said that she was struggling to breathe and kind of when she did speak, she was kind of bubbling in her mouth. Do you know, the the blood was coming through. So... You know, it's it's hard to, as a lot of this is from the press, it's hard to determine what is true, what isn't, what the press have added. Don't forget, just because it says something there doesn't mean it's true. They have a tendency to add in their own details because it makes it more interesting. There's nothing worse than a boring story. Um, so we don't know. Um, uh, police had a look in her bedsit. Uh, her flat that's all it really was it was kind of a one-room bedsit really she had loads of diaries a mass of papers containing lots of names and addresses because don't forget she was in contact with at least six thousand different polish people from around different communities um police believe that the murder may have been political uh but they really don't know who the assailant was and they did they kind of checked everyone as mentioned, we had the possible suspects, the underground worker who was in the hotel room, the teacher with the black eye, you know, all of these kind of came to nothing. Um, the police, uh, Metropolitan Police actually used different boroughs to kind of help out. I think Notting Hill helped out Bayswater, uh, Shepherd's Bush Police Station, you know, and they all started breaking things down into different groups because... Do you know, this was a massive inquiry, so because they had to deal with thousands of different people. So, uh, one group uh, was of Polish experts who were checking out hundreds of poles who were listed in Teresa's notebooks. Uh, a second group uh, was dealing with undesirables living in and around Gloucester Road at around that time. Third group was dealing with reports from around the country on the movement of poles who were living outside London, and a fourth fourth group. Uh, we're dealing with those people who called into the police station saying that they had inquiries. Um, 
obviously a lot of people in the Polish community, everyone said, look, she's not, there's no one in our community who would see her as a, uh, an enemy at all. She didn't seem to have any enemies, but you know, uh, don't forget she did have death threats before. We don't know much about the death threats. Uh, they will be in probably in the uh, police files, which I unfortunately I can't get access to, which is a real pain. Oh, can't wait to go back to the archives. Hope, hopefully January I'll be back there. That'll be lovely. I've got a list of all these files that I want to take out. Oh, uh, what else was there? Uh, there's, uh, it's, unfortunately, as with every case, there's always some sad bastards who are out there who are desperate for attention. So unfortunately, the police were dealing with a lot of cranks and people who kind of wanted to draw attention to themselves, turning up saying, oh, I saw this person. Oh, I did it. You know, quite a few people came forward and confessed to the murder. But police are able to whittle through this really easily because don't forget, they don't release all the information to the press. They they lead they release small bits and then when anyone comes forward they can double check anything and go oh okay so you uh you stabbed her what what did you what did you stab her with and they go a machete and you go right well get out get out you sad bastard um as mentioned her funeral uh the uh service took place at brompton oratory which was of course where uh, her friend was the uh polish assistant uh, Polish speaking officers mingled amongst the congregation to see if any perpetrators would reveal themselves. Because don't forget, this is the kind of thing that a killer would do. They would go to a funeral and kind of, you know, or, you know revel in the fact of what they had done. Um, there was a large uh, requiem which was sung. Uh, the three medals that she had earned for courage and valor uh, was rested on top of her coffin. Uh, and she was uh, carried to uh, Brompton Cemetery, uh, which is where she is still buried today. Uh, what else is there? So that was on the 1st of June, that was, and so not too long uh, later. Oh, what else is there? Uh, Count Teresa Lubienska was posthumously honoured with uh, uh, the Golden Cross of Merit with Swords in recognition of her devotion to the cause to free poland uh, the swords of her award recognize how her gallantry uh, had involved personal danger to herself and i think that is it that is it that is all the information i have on that so uh let's do the quiz and i'll have a slurp of my coffee hopefully it's not too hot now mm, it's a little bit too cold now oh Eva, can you warm up my coffee? Fuck off. Classic. Um, okay, question number one. What religion was Teresa? She was Roman Catholic. Question two. What was Teresa's husband's name? It was Edward. Question number three. What was in front and behind her flat in Warsaw? Uh, there was a German barracks and a Gestapo building. Hmm, nice place to live. Question four. Which concentration camp was she sent to? You get this one for free because I did bollocks it up earlier on. Well, uh, she was mainly sent to Ravensbrück, but initially, I didn't put this in the episode, originally she was at Auschwitz. Uh, question five. What day did the German invasion of Poland begin? That was the 1st of September 1939. And as a bonus, it lasted six days. Question six. What was her name at the concentration camp? I balls this up, so uh, you should have got part of this at least. Uh, she was called the White Angel of Ravensbrook. Uh, question seven. Which Polish spy was her friend? Easy one. That's Christina Skarbek code name christine granville if you haven't listened to that episode go back to uh, listen to the christine granville episode that's fascinating question eight which hospital did she die in a lot of the press being lazy assholes said that she died in paddington she didn't she died in st mary abbott's hospital which is uh, literally uh, just around the corner uh question nine who headed up the investigation there were two men it was uh, Detective Chief Inspector John DeRose and Chief Superintendent Edward Greenough. 
And for regular Murder Mile fans, you will know that they were the guys responsible for the Blackout Ripper case. Not responsible as in they committed the murders. Obviously, that was Gordon Frederick Cummings. Uh, but they were the, the detectives. And question 10. Uh, who was she buried near? She was buried near Emmeline Pankhurst. So, I think that's it. That's that episode. What time is it? Oh, it's not even nine o'clock. I've woken up. I've done my stuff. I've sorted out a lock. I've got my boat refloating. I've recorded this episode. Oh, if I power through this episode today, I might be able to get it all done by Thursday. And then that means I can I can do some... Uh, I can finish editing New Blue, get those ready and up, and then re-edit some more. Oh, early episodes of Murder Mile. I just want to try and get everything done by Christmas. So when January starts, I can do my research and then I can go on my travels and oh, disappear, disappear into the world. And maybe, maybe I've written on my notes here for myself, get a doggy. Because I won't have to do the walks anymore. I can get a doggy. We can go on our travels together. That'd be lovely. Right. That's me done. Uh, hope you enjoyed that. That was uh, episode 147. Uh, back next week. And next week's episode is a two-parter, if I remember correctly. Uh, so have yourself a good week. Stay safe. Be good. Lots of love. Bye-bye.